Okay, we're going to get started now. Got the mic all fixed. Um, good afternoon and Happy New Year. Uh, my name is Connie Gabe, and I'm here to welcome you to our first Winter Garden Forum for 2018. And thanks for coming out on this uh, snowy day. Um, I'm confident you'll be glad you did. Uh, our next two forums are February, uh, Sunday, February 11th with Laura Hawks presenting Ashton House Landscape Revival. And March 4th will be with Deb Walzer, who will talk about growing berries and will introduce the newest and coolest plants for 2018. And we hope to see you there. Um, before I introduce our speaker for today, I'd like to thank our partner, Iowa City Public Library, and Beth Fisher and Lily for um, making all this possible, getting things set up and, and being our tech gurus. Um, through the years, our nonprofit organization has funded over $2 million in projects, including the public gardens at the city-owned Ned Ashton House on Park Road and Terry, Truba, Terry Trueblood Recreation Area. Our all-volunteer effort has grown to include plantings and maintaining parks, uh, roadsides, riverfronts, median parkways, and public school grounds throughout the uh, Iowa City area. This year, we celebrate our 50th year of service to the community. Um, please, uh, we're looking forward to our annual plant sale in May. Uh, it's Sunday, May 5th, and our garden tour on June 23rd. And I wanted to say a little bit more about that. Um, the beautiful quilt that you might have noticed on the way in or you can uh, admire during the break or, or later, um, it's being raffled to benefit Project Green as we celebrate our 50th year. It was appliqued, quilted, and donated by Pam Earhart. Um, she is a member of Iowa City's Old Capital Quilters Group, uh, Guild, excuse me. And the title of the, of the quilt is Spring Bouquet. Um, and so we hope you join us for the, the uh, garden tour again, Saturday, June 23rd. <laughs> And um, there will also be some other colorful quilts um, stationed throughout the gardens during that tour. So you'll have a chance to see those. This is the one we're raffling, but the other ones are for viewing. Um, and the quilt raffle will take place June 24th. And we are um, selling raffle tickets today. They are uh, $5 a, eat, uh, a piece or 5 for $20. So you can get your raffle tickets as early as today. And again, probably at the plant sale and definitely at the, uh, at the uh, garden fair. So thank you for that. I um, want to thank our door prize contributors for today, uh, Garden Design Magazine, and you got a little flyer on that. Uh, they will contribute $12 for any subscription that we uh, generate through this, this process. Um, Iowa City Landscaping Garden Center and Project Green has our new a uh, much coveted uh, mug here for a door prize as well. And at our other events, um, we will those will be for sale as well. Um, and finally, please make sure to silence your cell phones. Uh, we'll, we'll start with a presentation by Lisa Orgler for the first 45 minutes to an hour, followed by a 15 minute refreshment break. And then we'll conclude with a 20 to 30 minute um, question and answer period. And if you'd prefer to write down your questions, I have a clipboard at the front so you can do that during break. Um, otherwise, you can stand up and ask them and we'll, we'll get them repeated or, or some, get a microphone to you or some other way. Um, today, I am very pleased to introduce Ms. Lisa Orgler. Um, Lisa is from Des Moines. Uh, she was promoted to senior lecturer in the horticultural department at ISU in April of 2017. Her education includes a BA and an MA from ISU as well. Lisa has numerous awards and recognition in her field of design and horticulture, including two years of being recognized as a Miller Faculty Fellow at ISU and receiving their Professional and Scientific Excellence Award. She served as chair and vice chair of the design and planning subcommittee of the American Public Garden Association and has many publications, including articles in the Iowa Horticulturist. Uh, Lisa uh, also um, contributes to a wide variety of, of topics published online, and that's, she'll be talking about that as well. Uh, she has a website called Paper Garden Workshop, um, and I would encourage you to 
to uh, access that to get some uh, great information and fun ideas. In Lisa's own words, I took off the internet, um, for the past few years I've lived a double life. By day I was a landscape architect gardener, while at night I created whimsical food illustrations for my blog, clients, and gift shops. It was finally time to merge these two worlds and fess up that it was perfectly okay. Today I explore garden design in my own experimental way through illustrations and photography. I have to pinch myself each day. <laughs> so with that, I want to introduce Lisa Orgler. So, I might need your help turning this on. Oh, is it on? It is on, isn't it? Yep. Oh, she's so sneaky. <laughs> I didn't think it was on. Hello, I'm, I'm so excited to be here. Thanks for inviting me. I am shocked that there's so many of you. I, you know, when, when Connie said there might be about 100 people, I'm like, well, not for me, I'm maybe 50 if, <laughs> if I'm lucky. Um, but no, thank you for coming here, I'm so excited. So like Connie said, I'm Lisa Orgler and I teach in the horticulture department at Iowa State. My degrees are in landscape architecture and I kind of moseyed my way around the Iowa State campus until I landed in the hort department and I'm just so lucky to teach landscape design there because my love has always been residential design and now I get to focus on that with my students and they are so much fun. And the other bonus is that I get all these wonderful ideas for talks that I get to give to the public now. Because now that I teach, I understand how to chunk things down into smaller bits and pieces. So it's a lot more fun to be able to teach that. The talk I'm doing today on garden rooms is really about how to create structure in your garden. Um, one of the things that I've noticed, and actually maybe we should go to the first slide, we often have this question, where do I begin? You know, we, we go to the nursery, the plants are on sale, and we're really excited. We want to buy things. We bring them home, and then we're like, where do I put this? <laughs> and, and I do the same thing. I, you know, I, I follow some guidelines, but still, I, I still get excited. We all do this. Um, so instead of getting home and being like, where should I put this, I want to step, take you a couple steps back and teach you a little bit. Oh, yeah, I forgot about the look that we have, too. <laughs> um, I always forget about that. So to, cre to create garden rooms, we want to create garden structure first. And I actually used to call this talk garden structure, and people thought I was talking about structures like arbors and pergolas and all of that, which you can use to create garden rooms. But garden structure really is about creating the spaces. So let's talk about a little bit about what garden structure is. Do I, do I have a, oh, oh wait, wait, wait. So when we talk, take away all the plants, it's the physical spaces that you're starting to see in your garden. So for instance, in the winter time, there are some bonuses to having winter. You can actually look out in your garden and see what the structure is. And what I mean by that, can you see walls? Can you see edges to the garden? Can you see ceilings? Like when you look at this garden, which is obviously in the winter, do we see structure? Do we actually see a garden room? Do we see some walls and edges and those types of things? Hopefully we're seeing a little bit of that. What about this image? Oh yeah, this image, yes, hopefully too. Do you see some structure here also? When you have raised beds, it's easy because you're creating that edge really easily with the timbers or whatever you're using for your raised beds. What about this garden? Do you see structure here? A little bit. There's a little bit there with the edge of the plants, but in general, there's probably not a lot. And does anybody yard, anybody's yard look like this? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> She's like, yes, that's me. <laughs> Um, so yeah, most of our yards look like this because we really haven't given them structure. So when we buy those plants at the nursery and then we come back and we're not sure where to put them, it's because we haven't established that structure, where the planting beds are, where the lawn spaces are, all of those things. We usually have whatever's left over in our yard. And we'll talk all about that. So hopefully you'll... Well, this is a fun presentation because I, I always get a lot of, oh, I never thought about doing it that way. So I'm hoping there's a little, a little bit of that before I leave. So let's talk about spatial design. You won't have that yet, not for a while. Um, we'll talk about this first, the boring stuff. So does anybody know what spatial design is in a garden? Has anybody ever heard of that term before? Yeah. A little bit. Does anybody want to be brave enough to, to try it? Areas. Areas. You're creating areas. Thank you. I won't, I won't make you feel bad if you get it wrong. I'll just be like, hmm, yeah, well, anybody else know that? Um, so spatial design is creating the areas in your garden. What about planting design? And we usually think of planting design as landscape design, but plant, landscape design is both of these. You need to have both of these things for landscape design. So what's planting design? Any thoughts? Hmm? Texture. Texture, colors, exactly all those things. You're arranging the plants in the beds, 
and you are considering form texture color, which we will not talk about today because we don't have time for that. That's a whole other lecture, which I think I will be somewhere soon doing that talk. But um, you can definitely go on my website, though, and learn about those types of things. But today we'll talk about spatial design. So spatial design is looking at the larger picture. So it's kind of the master plan of looking at your entire garden. And then it's a, the overall plan is you're organizing the spaces. So somebody said the areas. You're organizing the garden rooms, and you're trying to figure out where those are. And when you actually create the, or when you're organizing the spaces, you're creating lawn shapes and you're creating planting beds. And that's the cool thing about this process is that once you figure out what the rooms look like, you're revealing your planting beds. So then when you go to Earl May or wherever you go to get your plants and you come back, now you know kind of, you, at least you generally know where to put them. Now you actually have planting beds to put them in, which is nice. So planting design is about organizing the plants in the bed. I know that's hard in itself because I know we all struggle with that also. Um, but if you can get this first part done, that helps. And then you can focus on how to arrange the plants in the beds. And of course, someone mentioned form, texture, color. You need to consider that with plant material. And then the plants are reinforcing your spaces. So we'll talk about that today, that there are walls and ceilings and floors in your garden. And usually plant materials are those things. And you can use other materials also, but plants are those. So here is a, a quick map or plan of a garden. So the spatial design would be the rooms. Here's our laundry yard. I'm sure a lot of you have that. And the picnic lawn and the reading nook. And these are the separate rooms in my garden. And then the planting design is what's happening in here. OK, so when you, yeah, when you come home and you're confused about what to do with those plants, it's because we just haven't established where those beds go yet. So that's the difference between planting and spatial design. So I'm going to do, show you some examples now of some strong garden rooms so you can see them. Um, and then I'll give you a, a long lecture of why I think it's important to create strong bed lines and all those things. And then we'll go into the fun stuff. Um, so here's a, obviously a, a strong design. What are the shapes that they're using in this design? They're, they're using circles. And I'm going to keep saying today over and over again how important it is for you to make a shift in your mind. You're designing spaces when you're doing landscape design. You're not just putting a row of plants around your house, which is OK to do that as long as you're thinking about what spaces you're creating. So when this person or this designer created this design, do you think this lawn space was just left over after they put their plants in the ground? No. They probably designed the lawn spaces in the paths first, and then they decided how the plants would reinforce that. So when you leave here today, hopefully you can remember, OK, how, can I, how do I design my spaces first, and then use everything else, my plants, materials, to reinforce those spaces? So here's another one. Again, you see the lawn space and you see the patio. Was that just leftover space, that lawn? <laughs> it was probably designed. For those of you that are lucky to live in town and have a fence around your yard, it's really easy to do this. The people that struggle are the ones that are more in the suburbs that the yards bleed to the other yard because you feel really uncomfortable about closing in your yard. So for those that are in town, you're really lucky because it is nice to have that small little space. But it is cooler when you can design it that way. So this is what we often do. We go to the store, we buy our plants and our trees, we plop them in the ground, and then whatever is left over is our lawn space. So here's our negative space. But what I'd like you to start thinking about is how can you create rooms by having a positive lawn space and thinking about what that looks like, or a, or a patio or a deck. It doesn't have to be a lawn. Um, but whatever space you're creating, think about what that space is, and then use your plants to reinforce that. So here is a planting or a bed design from an aerial, not aerial, a bird's eye view. Is this an aerial photo? Um, no, this is a drawing, of course. And you're looking from the sky, looking down. And this is what we typically do. We just put planting beds where we want them. And like, OK, let's just line my driveway now. Let's put a berm out here. And we're going to put some planting beds back there. But what I would like you to think about is how can everything work as a unit, more like this, versus having everything just kind of scattered. And you're creating spaces versus, and even these spaces are open. You don't have to totally enclose your spaces. This is still a strong space. So you don't have to totally enclose it. You just need to have really strong bed lines and make sure things work together. So if you have purposeful space and positive space, you're going to have good uh, garden rooms, of course, and good garden structures. So I will go through some more examples, and I'll show you how to do that. There's actually a process for it. So these are just some examples of different gardens. And I love when you design in plan view and you play with shapes. So if you are working on your own design, play with shapes to start. I mean, they could be circles, squares, rectangles. 
Believe it or not, curvilinear designs are actually the hardest designs to do. My students are finding that out. That's all we ever see is curvilinear. I'm not against it. I love curvilinear designs. But curvilinear are actually the hardest because you're not working with a strong shape to start. So I would at least start with circles, and maybe those circles can mold into curvilinear designs if you want curvilinear. Of course, this one is based on rectilinear. So we have a lot of different shapes. And you can play with that in, in a plan view first and see how they relate to each other. So you can see they've got lawn, and they've got concrete, and they've got wood. And they just played with those shapes until it fit the way that they wanted to. And it's a great, great garden room. Actually, there's several garden rooms there. You have the lawn space, which is a garden room. You have the patio. And then you've got the entry to the house, which is neat. So this is another one. And of course, we've got circles repeating again on this one. And it doesn't look like they're quite done. There's a lot of empty beds, but they're working on it. But it's really a beautiful design. It's just very simple and clean. But again, they're using a shape. And they're just repeating that and then putting the sidewalk around it. So very simple. So if you just start that way, it makes it a little bit easier. And then I wanted to show you some curvilinear, too, because I didn't want you to think I was against curvilinear. Curvilinear can also be very strong. And one of the things I always like to mention is making sure your bed lines are strong when you're doing curvilinear. You don't want this thing going like this. And honestly, maintenance-wise, it's harder to mow a bed line that's really crazy like that. You want it clean and simple. So don't think in your brain you're making the bed line around the plants. The bed lines are the edge of your space. So design your space first and then create the bed lines to fit that, and then the plants reinforce it in their beds. A lot of times we'll put plants in the ground, and then we'll put the bed line around the plants, but it's the space you're creating, not the bed, if that makes any sense. And then this is, of course, a rectilinear one again, real simple, really strong. I'm sure a lot of your yards look like this. Somebody here probably does, though, and they're not going to admit it. So how do we create positive spaces? I'm going to go through the process so you can see what designers use to go through this. So we're going to go through bubble diagrams or functional diagrams. And these are all on your handout, so hopefully help. And I also have all this on my website. So if you go on my website and just type in the search engine, you know, the, these words will pop up. All these things will pop up. Garden structure studies, which is where we do all the forms and, and the shapes. And then we'll do a preliminary design. And then I'll talk to you a little bit about garden rooms and how to add those details to make them more like a room. But this is what's so cool about it. When you follow this process, the rooms are just revealed to you. And I'm hoping you're, you have that aha moment soon here when I show you that. So the first thing to do, you can do bubble diagrams. Has anybody ever done bubble diagrams or functional diagrams in here or have heard of that? So some of you have. Excellent. And sometimes you can call them concept or conceptual designs and use and just quickly draw little ideas of what you'd like to do. Um, you have your plan. And you just start drawing bubbles. You really just do blobs and bubbles of things that you want to do. So you make a list of things that you like in your yard. Maybe you want a compost bin, and you want a vegetable garden, and you want a lawn space to play croquet, and, um, and whatever else you want to do. You just make bubbles of where those things go. It's a relationship diagram. So it's about figuring out where things should go in the, the yard before you actually start drawing hard line details. So it's just, it's just a nice, simple way, especially for those that have acreages. Sometimes people get overwhelmed that have a lot of land. This is the bubble diagram or the functional diagram is a great way to approach that acreage and try to figure out where you want things before you actually start putting shapes to them. So you don't need shapes at this level, which is really nice. So you can see the house in the middle, and you can see all the bubbles all the way around. And they're obviously, they're not, nothing fancy. They're just saying these are plantings. And what do you think this might be? Yeah, or, a, or a, something special, maybe, like a focal point. I'm not sure what it is, but usually when you put an asterisk, it means something special, like a focal point or artwork or something that you want people to notice when they come in the yard. But you can make up your own symbols. You don't have to, there's not really a set thing standard, or standard symbols to use when you're doing these. But let's go through an example of how I go about doing a bubble diagram or a functional diagram. First thing you need is a base map. And I don't know how many of you have access to your base maps for your yards. Of course, you can uh, go to the, the, what county are we in? <laughs> I almost said Story County. I'm so used to saying that. The Story County Assessor's page, you probably don't want to go to that one. Uh, Johnson County Assessor's page, you can at least get the uh, property lines of your property to start. And you can do it on grid paper if that's easier for you. You can go to Google Maps. You can go to Google Earth. Um, Google Earth sometimes is difficult because sometimes the trees are in the way if you have a lot of trees. But at least the assessor's page will help you get your property lines and all that if you have it. Of course, you can always also hire a surveyor, or you can measure your yard yourself with your tape measure, however you want to do it. But I always like grid paper. Grid paper is the easiest to do it on if you have a small enough yard. 
for those that have acreages, you'll probably have to work a little bit larger than that. So this is my house that I'm, not, it's not my house, this is our example of our house that we're going to use today. And I want to show you how you go through the simple process of doing a functional diagram. So the first thing I do is I make a wish list of everything I want. So I would do that, I would always do that first, it seems obvious, but before you start drawing all these shapes, you want to make sure that you have your list. So on my list, I'm going to have, I want a lawn. And the story is always when I, we bought our current house, my son said to me, Mom, don't put gardens everywhere. I need a lawn so I can play football. So I always remember that now. Um, so we have our lawn. We, have, we want a patio. We need a shed. And then we want a vegetable garden, a compost area, and a cutting garden. So that's my list. So now I'm going to do my bubbles to figure out how those would all lay out on my sites. So here's my lawn spaces. And again, these are not the sh final shapes of my lawn. I'm just saying, in general, this is where I want the lawn to be. So don't ever feel like you have to have shapes. Patio and shed, and I'm placing them here because the patio needs to be outside my double doors in the back because I want to walk out my kitchen into the, onto the patio. And I want a focal point in the back, so I'm just going to decide to put the shed back there so I have a nice focal point from my patio space. And oftentimes I, there's somebody in the room that will say, why would you ever use an ugly shed as a focal point? Does my shed have to be ugly? No. <laughs> But it is funny, I always get that from somebody. And then, and then, yeah, here, I'm showing you how I have a focal point across the yard. And then I digress here because I want to show you how sheds don't have to be ugly. So I'll just, we'll just take a break for a moment. Um, so this is our neighbor's shed, which my husband actually built on the top left because we used to live next door. And then this is a shed down the street. But look at how cool these sheds are. Why wouldn't you want to use these as focal points? And then this is our shed many years ago. My daughter, who is much older now, but... You know, when we built our shed, I wanted it to be a focal point when you walked between the garage and the house. And, that's, and I asked my husband, can we paint it orange? And he gave me the weird look. And I'm like, and I'm like I can't please, just, just, the, just the shed. I'm not going to paint the house orange, just the shed. We painted the house mustard yellow, though. I have to admit, I got him to do that. <laughs> and it is pretty cool. Um, but sheds are really cool. So if you're going to use something as a focal point, make it really cool looking. You don't have to have it ugly. So other things we want to add are our vegetable garden, our compost area. We want a cutting garden. And I'm putting them all near the shed so you can work in those areas and then go to the shed if you need to. Um, and then I'm going to add the planting beds because I want to use the planting beds to reinforce those spaces that I'm creating with the lawns. So this is one functional diagram. And, like, and, I, and oh, I got to put a path in there too to get from the front to the backyard. So we got to add that also. You know, I, I do a lot of functional diagrams. I will go through several renditions. What I'll do is I'll put tracing paper over my drawing that I've created for the yard, and then I'll do one really quick, and then, eh, and then I go to the next, and I do the next one, and then I flip it, and then I go to the next one. Don't be afraid to use a lot of tracing paper. Just get those roll tracing papers. That is not the right grammar. But get the roll of tracing paper, and then just use it over and over and over again to try different options. Don't feel like you have to be on your first option and be done with it. Try and try and try again. That's how I like to look at it. So here's another bubble diagram. Same list of materials that I want to use or items, but now we're going to use them in a different order or a different way. And on this one, the shed and the patio are still the same place, but I decided I wanted to put the vegetable garden and cutting garden in front of the shed because I was envisioning walking through this lawn and then opening this really pretty gate and then walking through my garden to get into the shed. So that's why I was just exploring that option too to see what that would look like. So you can see they're just slightly different. So those are our functional diagrams. And again, you can do more than just two. But now we're going to take those bubbles and those blobs and we're going to give shape to them. So like all those shapes I was showing you in the beginning, the squares and the circles, this is the process to do that and it's really cool when you see how that works. So some things to think about when you're creating structure is you can be inspired by, um, is, your, is your space going to be formal or informal? So that'll tell you right away, am I going to use rectilinear or am I going to use curvilinear? So you can think about that first. Then you have to think about, do I want to use a dominant shape? So do I want to use an oval, a square, a circle, or a combination of those things? You can do any of those. Another thing people like is looking at history and then checking to see if maybe they can be inspired by something like French gardens or Japanese gardens or mid-century modern. Some of you might have a mid-century modern home that you want to replicate a, a different kind of garden for, a rectilinear one. So these are the types of things that you can look at when you're creating structure. So let's look at some different other different options. And this is, this is a great book. It's expensive because it is a textbook, but Residential Landscape Architecture by Booth and Hiss. Does anybody have this book? Nobody has this book. I don't even know if the library would have this. I should have asked you before I came. Um, but this is a great book. 
And they describe all of these things that I'm talking to you about, but they've got great illustrations. So this is a great example. So here's their functional diagram, okay? And hopefully you can envision this, the one up in the top left here. They have a garden, a lawn, a, they call it a terrace or a patio, and then a walk. So look at that blob. Now they're going to take that, those blobs and give it different forms. So do you see how the, the patio is always in the bottom right? But they're trying it in different ways. So the objects are still like, this is still the garden, this is the lawn, the walk, and this is the patio. So it's the same in all of them. But some of them, they're doing a 45 degree angle. They're doing arc and tangent. They're doing rectilinear, curvilinear, um, irregular is one of them's called. And then they're starting to play with those shapes. So once you start figuring out where things go, now you can start playing with, okay, what kind of shapes do I want to do to show how to, or to actually put that into my garden? So this is one way of doing that, and it's really neat. I just love this. And this is like, this is the best example. Here's another example of the different kinds of shapes. So if you're doing a lawn, for instance, all the different ways you could do that, and all the different shapes that you could use. This is another amazing, amazing tool that you can use. It's called Lines of Influence. It's also called lines of force. So depending on what book you read, um, lines of force or lines of influence. It's basically taking your architecture of your house and then taking the lines off the house and making a grid pattern. So you have the house in the middle, and you see how these lines are all lined up with the doors, the windows, the edges of the, of the, uh, the, the building. If any, there's little alcoves and garages, the lines come off of that. You can do 45 degrees off that. You can just do 90 degree angles, whatever you want. And this is the coolest system. When you do this grid, your spaces are revealed to you. It's just weird how it works, and it's just so much fun. And it's funny when I show this to my students, at first they're like, oh, I don't have the time to do this. And then they struggle for an hour in studio. I'm like, OK, now you need to take five minutes and just draw this grid quickly. And as soon as they draw this grid and then put tracing paper over it, they're like, oh my gosh, this is so much easier. <laughs> So it is a lot easier to do a lines of influence study or a lines of force study. So I would try this on your property. Some, some people have asked me if, like, if they have a steep yard in the back. Yeah, it's not going to be as easy. You have to do terracing, obviously, for this to work. But if you have a flat yard, definitely try Even if you don't have a flat yard, this still works. You just have to be more creative in how you lay it out. But definitely try that. So that's, that's a fun one to try. So here's the same yard with two different forms being used. We have the circles, obviously, on the right side. And then the left side, we have the rectangles. Same, similar design in both yards. They're just trying different forms. And again, you can see they're designing the lawn spaces and the patios first, and then the beds are supporting those spaces, which is so much fun. So let's try with the garden that we're doing now, OK? So we did our functional diagrams already. Here's our first functional diagram. Oh, I'm, oh this is the second one that I created, the one with the vegetable garden, the cutting garden in front of the shed. And now I'm going to put some shape to it. So we're going to go over to our little garden structure study, and we're going to start giving things shapes. So I'm using ovals and rectangles. And now I'm saying my lawn is going to be this shape and this size, and this is the bed lines, and my patio is going to be a square, and my vegetable garden is going to be right there, and my shed's going to be that size, and everything's going to be exactly what it's going to be, and I'm going to have strong shapes. Not picking out plants yet. I know a lot of you get really overwhelmed with picking out plants, and what do you do with them? But if you do this process first, this is so much nicer. You don't have to think about all that yet until towards the end, which makes it a lot easier. So let's do this exact same one, same functional diagram. And now we're going to do a different garden structure study. Let's see what I did for this one. I can never remember. Oh, yeah, this one. So this one is more of an arc and tangent, which means all the corners are rounded. So you can see the front yard is a square, and then the backyard is a square. We have the patio is going to be round now. But basically, the vegetable garden I left is square also. So just a little bit different than the other one. And I think I might have them side by side in the next one. Perfect. So you can see how I did both of them just slightly different. And you can do way many more of these than what I've showed you. There's a lot of different ways that you can do this. So there's the first functional diagram that I created. And I'll show you what I'm going to do with this garden structure study. These are a little bit more fun. So this is a curvilinear one. And again, it's a little harder to do this because you have to make sure the balance is right and the lines are right. But this is what I came up with my curvilinear. So the patio and the shed are still in the same place. The vegetable garden shifted a little bit. And I did move the compost bin. Um, one of the things that you'll find with design is it's a cyclical process. So you might go through it and realize, oh, that didn't quite work. So now I'm going to have to go back and reevaluate it. 
So when I had the compost bin on this side and then I did this curvilinear design, I realized it would be better to move it on the other side. So that was one change that I did make when I was doing this design. So here's our bubble diagram again. And now we're going to do a 45 degree angle design. So again, very similar. We have our sheds shifted a little bit because of the lawn shift into the 45, but basically everything else is in generally in the same area as the functional. But again, you can break, I mean, if you change your functional a little bit, that's okay. Just to make sure it fits the new shapes that you're laying out. Okay, so here's our fun shapes. I love these shapes. So now, oh, let's compare these. So our curvilinear and our 45 degree angle. But again, you can see that I'm designing the spaces first. And the dark green, or the green are the planting beds. So the next step is the preliminary design. So this, and I, and I, and I hope some light bulbs went off on this last step with the, with the squares and the rectangles and all of that, because that's a step we always miss. So I'm hoping now that that's in your back pocket, you can use that to your advantage. So now we've got our preliminary design. The cool thing about the preliminary design is you still don't have to pick out plants. I mean, you have to pick out pretend plants, but you're not actually picking out actual plants yet. So again, taking that pressure off a little bit, you're designing your landscape without feeling overwhelmed, without, without knowing all the plant material. So here is our first preliminary. So I have the, the garden structure study. I know where the planting beds are, the patio, all of that. So now I get to this one, and I'm like, okay, now I can put the hardscape materials in there. My, where would I put my chair and tables? I'm going to put plant materials in here. I'm not identifying them. All I know is that I want some lower plants back here and some taller plants back here. So I'm starting to use those plants now to reinforce those rooms and those shapes for that landscape. So hopefully, um, and this is so much fun when you get to this. My, my students love this because they're always nervous about learning landscape design. And then I go through these first three steps and they're like, oh, I guess this isn't so bad. Because you know, when, follow, when you follow these little guidelines, it really helps to get, especially to this point. The, I mean, I'll admit the hardest part is picking out the plants. So the next step, which we're not going to cover today, um, the planting design part of it is then picking out the plants. But once you understand what size plants you want, where you want evergreens, where you want deciduous, you've taken out all the heartache already. And now you can go to Earl May and buy your plants and you'd be like, Whatever you bought, like, well, I do need some small plants here, so I guess I'll just put those small plants here. So now you kind of generally know where you could put them if you wanted to. So that's the first preliminary design. Another one that I did was this curvilinear one. So let's, just, let's see what that one ended up looking like, too. So again, and I did change the front walk on this one because I didn't like, because this didn't work. So I just changed it to make it work with the curve. So again, you know where everything is, so now I just add the materials, the hardscapes, the plant materials, and I just reinforce those spaces. And that's really how it works, which is really fun. I kind of want to live in one of those gardens now. <laughs> you think my yard would look like that, but it hasn't gotten there yet. So here's some examples of other preliminary designs that you can look at. So again, preliminaries, we're not saying exactly what the plants are. They're just saying medium deciduous tree. So you just generally know what you want, and then you have to find that plant. And then you can do your research later. But hopefully you can see all the shapes are really strong. That backyard is a half circle. The front yard is a, is a half, actually two half circles, and they're playing with those shapes again, and then putting the plants in the beds that they're creating. This is a fun one. I love this one. So the top one, real simple design, but they want to show how if you just angle it slightly, how it actually makes the yard just feel light, slightly bigger, even though it's the same size yard, or it just adds more interest to it by having that angle. So little things like that, it's okay to, to make a little shift to add a little bit more interest to your yard. And then I just love this design too. Curvilinear, once again, um, we have our planting beds, our lawn spaces, our patio spaces. It's curvilinear, but it's all very purposeful still. So you're just still being thoughtful about what does that lawn shape look like. I always tell my students, if you can lift the lawn shape out and it still looks like a nice shape, then you've done a good job. But if, you've, if, you, if you pull it up and it's just blobby mess, then you, you, know, you really haven't thought about what that space should look like. Okay. So is everybody ready to go home now and design their lawn spaces and stuff, I hope? OK. <laughs> so now, yeah. now that we've created these wonderful spaces, these are our garden rooms. And now we can actually make them really cool garden rooms by going in there and reinforcing, the, reinforcing them. And I, want, I, want, I didn't want to use the word decorate, but I guess it is decorating with our plants and our furniture and all the cool stuff. Um, but now we're going to use the garden rooms, and we're going to think about floors, and we're going to think about walls, and we're going to think about ceilings. And it seems so elementary, but it's amazing how we don't necessarily do that. 
So something to always think about when you're designing outside, even if it's just your deck space, think about, okay, the floor is the wood, but what am I doing with the walls? What am I doing with the ceiling in my spaces to reinforce the idea that it's a room? So we're gonna go through each of these. Oh, here's our rooms, I should point them all out. So we have our one room right here, the lawn space. We've got our vegetable garden. And then we've got our front yard, which is also a room. And then the other spaces we've got, we've got our little patio space, which is like a mini space. And then we've got that little space up there. So we've got a lot of rooms happening in this garden. You could have one room in your backyard. You can have several rooms. It just depends on the function of each of them and what, they're, what you're using them for. Oh, there's another one back there, <laughs> my potting area. OK, so floors. Let's just brainstorm as a group. What kind of things can we use on the garden floor in our garden? Any ideas? Grass? Grass? Mulch? Flagstone, excellent stone. Anything else? Ground covers? Moss. Moss, chips, all those things. Excellent. So some people mentioned lawn, stone, and of course I had mentioned decks before, brick, anything, anything you can walk on. So just as you give attention to your indoor rooms, if you give attention to your indoor rooms, <laughs> Whatever you do on your indoor rooms, think about how you can do that for your outdoor rooms also. Some of the coolest designs I've seen have been done by interior designers outside because they really understand how to create a space. And I went to a garden walk in Memphis, the Cooper Young Garden Walk, which was amazing, like 75 gardens on this walk. It was insane. Um, and they are, the, the things that they do in their gardens are just amazing. And, but some of them were interior designers that were the designers for the, out, for the gardens. And those were just crazy, the things that they did in their gardens. So here are some floors, some garden floors. I'm not sure if you're going to do anything like this, but this is kind of cool. I think that's just concrete. And they've just kind of carved it out. Stenciling, and then of course wood, but you can do all kinds of beautiful things. And of course the ground covers and everything around it that also contribute to that. And then again, I mean, this is a beautiful outdoor room, but look at that beautiful brick design. It's just a traditional pattern, but how much that adds to that traditional look. So if you're thinking of a contemporary garden or traditional or whatever you're thinking about, make sure your, your materials and your patterns reflect that. And again, just really beautiful, just a path walkway there. I mean, you can change this path however you want. It just depends on how, what kind of feel you want to give to the garden and how you want that floor to feel. And then this is, this is crazy. Whoever did this was really at, attentive to detail. But, <laughs> but it is beautiful. It is beautiful. <laughs> Too much time on his hands, yep. And again, just some brick. This is a small space. I don't know how many of you have really narrow spaces. One of my favorite areas in our garden is the space between our house and our garage. It's probably only 10 feet. And I love it because I have all these beautiful little details of plants and our brick walk goes through there. And it's just a really neat space. Sometimes I think smaller spaces are a lot easier to design. Um, but this is a really cool space. So let's talk about walls now. What kind of things can you use for the walls in your garden? Fences, trees, shrubs. Yep, shrubs, all kinds of shrubs, trees, plants. The house. The house itself, excellent. And then the garage, take advantage of those things. Trellises, Trellises vines, somebody said vines, right? <laughs> um, so all of those things. So here's our example of fences. So for those in the room that are lucky enough to already have a fence, you guys are already three steps ahead of everybody else. Because again, I think, it's, I think it's hard when you live more in an area where your the yards bleed into each other because then you're scared to close them off. But if you already live in a neighborhood where everybody's done that, I'm not saying you should do it, but I'm just saying if you have done it already, it's a lot easier to create these spaces. So of course, walls, plant materials, hedges, all kinds of fun things. So, and there's other things you can use for hedges. You don't always have to clip them. So these are some beautiful grasses. And then this is just a breezeway between the house and the garage. But again, it's a nice edge to a garden if you want to put a garden there. And someone had mentioned the house and I had mentioned the garage. Use the walls that are there in the garden, whether it's a shed or whatever, to your advantage as one of the walls for your garden. You can do all kinds of neat things with that. Of course, walls are out of materials. We have fences, plant materials. Vertical gardening, if anybody wants to take a stab at that. <laughs> um, things like mirrors and frames and collections. I, I saw a collection once of someone collected those old uh, pots. What are they called with the really cool colors on them? And they had them all on their wall outside cooking utensils. They had them all on their wall outside in their garden. And it was a neat way to deal with a wall in a garden and have their collection on there. So let's talk about ceiling. Ceilings are the hard one, or maybe not. What can we use for a ceiling outside? Trees, pergola. pergola, 
Anything else? Awnings. Awnings, excellent. Does anybody have like little tables with little umbrellas on them? And so umbrellas are perfect because it's a great way to, to bring the scale down, but not in a real expensive way. So it's a great way to just add a little bit of cover over you if you need it. And ceilings are one of those things that you don't always have to have a ceiling. You could just have the sky. I like to reserve ceilings for special places. So because that's when you want to bring the scale down. So usually it's a sitting area or an eating area or you want shade somewhere. So you're obviously not going to cover your entire garden with, shit, with uh, I was going to say shade, but with a ceiling. Um, but you might want to have trees everywhere, and that's perfectly fine. But you don't have to cover your entire garden with uh, a ceiling if you don't want to. I would reserve it for someplace special. And of course, here's some examples. So this is an allee. So for those who know what an allee is, an allee is when you have two rows of plants or shrubs on either side of a walkway. But this is a great ceiling. It's beautiful. I mean, obviously it's blooming now, but even when it's not blooming, and it's, or even in the wintertime, it'll look beautiful because you'll have that ceiling of trees. Someone mentioned uh, awning. So this canvas structure is kind of the same idea. And I know it's harder for us to have these types of things here because it gets cold and we have to take them all down and it gets windy. And, um, but that is a neat idea. Uh, this is an example of why it's neat to have a structure in a certain location. This is, you know when you're walking down this path and you see that pergola at the end of the walkway, that that's something special down there. So that ceiling is telling you, oh yeah, that's a, that's a cool little room down there and I want to go see what it is. And then they have the sitting area, or the, actually I guess it's an eating area back here. So there's a reason why that ceiling is there in, on multiple levels, probably shade also. But it's also just kind of telling you that's a special place right there, which is really fun. This is a small ceiling. I mean, this is just one little area. But again, it's protecting that one little sitting area that's getting a, just a little ceiling. So you don't need a big ceiling. It's just telling you that little area is a special place. And that's great. And then this is a great pergola, too. Again, just over the eating area, which is really fun. And then this is just an arbor that you can walk through from one place to another. I mean, they're not, no one's going to stand under here necessarily, but it's a nice threshold to say you're entering one garden space into another garden space. It's a nice doorway. So that's another way to use ceilings, which is fun also. So garden structure, more examples here really quick. So, so some of this is work from other artists or other designers. Um, and you can see this is a curvilinear design. But again, a beautiful, strong garden room. And look at, the, look at this, how everything works together. I want to point this out. So this is the patio or the deck. But look at how all of this works together to, to reinforce that space. So everything is working as one unit versus this is happening over here and that's happening over there. And then, of course, this is another lawn or a circle one. So you've got the circle patio and then you've got a circle lawn. I love this one. This is such a small little garden, but look how simple it is. I just love this. So you have this real simple patio, but see how the patio is being shaped to reinforce the lawn? So it's those details of making sure, but they're both strong spaces, so you have to think about both, and then how do they work next to each other? And that's real simple. I mean, this isn't a tiny little yard. Anybody could do that one. And then this is more of a rectilinear design for those that have pools in their backyard. <laughs> um, but this is a beautiful design, too. And again, real simple, just a circle, and then you've got some, a walkway coming in with a bench, so real simple idea. So one of the things that I provided for you today is this little handout with a little, does anybody have their little cut out this right? Can I borrow that? Thank yeah, you. Sure. This one right here, I, I didn't think we, and we won't. <laughs> I'm looking at the time now. Um, I, I didn't think we'd have time to do this today, but I gave you this handout because this is a little exercise that you can do on your own if you want to, to create a garden room. So here's one of them. And this is an activity that I do with my students, and I also do it with junior high and uh, middle school kids. And I sh we talk about the floors, walls, and the ceilings of a garden. And then I take them through the exercise, and I say, OK, just like I did with you, what, what can be a floor? Then they draw the floor on number one on the on this sheet. And then when they're done, we talk about it. And then they draw the two walls. And then they, and, and they think about how does it relate to the floor. So if you have a space in your own garden that you want to start thinking about, you can use this sheet to start thinking about how you would lay that out. Unfortunately, the paper's not big enough, so the ceiling's really tiny. <laughs> But you can hopefully you can imagine it bigger than that. But this is just a little activity for you to go through if you want. And I think I've got another example here somewhere. Or maybe I don't. I thought I did. I thought I had two of them. Um, but you can go on my website if you want to. This sheet is on there for free. You can just download it if you want more. And there's a video, actually I think it's of this one, of me actually creating it if you want to see me go through the process. But it's just a fun activity for you. So if you want to practice at home, you can definitely do that. And then as a summary, so when you're creating your garden rooms, 
hopefully I've got it in your brain now. You're always thinking about positive, purposeful spaces. And to do that, you're going to create those bubble diagrams. And then you're going to create and put short, uh, forms to them by using lines of influence or by just picking forms and shapes to do that. And then you're going to create a preliminary design. And then eventually a master plan, but we didn't cover that. The master plan is when you pick out the actual plants. And then you can start thinking about the actual details of the garden rooms, which is a lot of fun. That's like the most fun part. And then that's it. And I know we don't do questions yet, right? So, <laughs> but, we, but I know we're going to have snacks, right? <laughs> I guess Connie is going to do all those announcements. I wasn't sure if she wanted me to do it. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Lisa. <laughs> You're welcome. <laughs> Um, that was very fun. Lots of lots of things that we can do to uh, capitalize on that. And what we're going to do right now is take a uh, 15, 20 minute break, something like that. Since there's a big crowd, um, you'll all want to get through the, the coffee and cookies part. So uh, please do mm -hmm. that. And then I'll just make an announcement at about oh, 10 after 3, something like that, to come back. And again, just to remind you, you can write your questions down there on the clipboard if you'd prefer to. Um, I'm sure Lisa will be milling about a little bit too, so if you <laughs> are lucky enough to grab her, I'm sure she'll talk. And um, otherwise, you can. I'll have a, a microphone to take around to. Oh, and then also, uh, we just want to remind you that we have raffle tickets. Uh, you can get a closer look at the uh, the quilt there and then raffle tickets for the quilt this summer. So enjoy the treats. Uh, how do you feel about rectilinear vegetable gardens with a curvilinear yard design? Does it work? Yeah, so yes, definitely. You can definitely mix a rectilinear design with a curvilinear design. So what I would suggest if you're doing a vegetable garden that's rectilinear, which most of our gardens usually are, is just to add something else rectilinear in the yard. Or maybe make sure you line it up with something like the house that's also rectilinear, and then put the curvilinear lines in between them. Just make sure there's a relationship between the vegetable garden and something else, like maybe the patio or the house or something. I always like to have axes. Like I like to have the entry to the vegetable garden be on axes with the shed or with the patio or something. And then it fits. Then it seems like it works instead of just kind of being lost somewhere. So you can definitely mix different shapes in your, in your gardens, definitely. Who else has Connie's got? Okay. Um, how would you soften a fish pond set in the shade uh, by, by plants, with plants? Yep. And luckily, we talked about that already. So, don't have it in the shade. <laughs> don't have it in the shade, but it is in the shade. So, we're going to. So, I, I don't know the, the, right, the best answer for you without looking at the site, but I would say make sh I would make sure that wherever it is, it's working with your other spaces. And then, obviously, when you try to soften it with plants, I won't give you specific plants, but. Um, just obviously you want to just soften the edges with plants, but make sure those beds are working with the other, and I wish I had a dry eraser board or something. So if, you're gonna, if, you, if your pond's here and you're trying to soften the edges, make sure you're thinking about how it relates to the other spaces, if that makes any sense. So then you're softening. So I'm not giving you really good answers here. Just put plants around them. No. <laughs> <laughs> Poor thing. I already talked to her earlier. I don't <laughs> Try to cover those plastic edges and all those uglies that you don't like. <laughs> Make those fish happy. <laughs> I don't think that one's, maybe this one isn't working. Okay. Um, ideas for rooms or areas for, uh, for the wish list for small uh, city front yards. So ideas for mm -hmm. rooms and, and, and a wish list for small city front yards with standard sidewalk and no driveway. So this garden right here, I brought up Instagram because this garden, I don't know if you can see it very well. This is in Washington, DC. This is their front yard and I am standing on the sidewalk taking this photo. So you can see how tiny this is. So you can do, I mean, there's no lawn here. It's all hardscape and it's all plant materials. But I wanted to make sure that you saw that you don't have to have lawn in your front yard. If you have a small area, I mean, it can be all plant. You can still define a space like this, a patio, and then have some beautiful furniture. And it can still be a wonderful little space. I mean, obviously, if you've been to Boston or Washington, D.C. or, any, or Philadelphia, you're going to see gardens like this a lot. And one of the things I love doing is walking around as much as I can in cities like this so I can take photos like this. Um, but this is one of my favorite ones that I saw. But isn't that the coolest thing ever? But
But yeah, you can definitely just use that same idea of the, the rectangles and the squares and all of that and just make it in a smaller scale. And this is even easier to design because now you've you got the wall of the house already. You've got the wall of the sidewalk, basically, and then you just need to add a little hedge or a fence or whatever to kind of not let the public in. I'm sure there was something here, so I couldn't walk in here. They probably have people taking photos of their yard all the time. <laughs> like, oh, there's another one. Um, but yeah, this is, this is a great little example of that. That's why I brought that up. So good luck with that, whoever's got the cool backyard or the front yard. I love that. Thank you. So I'm one of those with the acreages. Mm -hmm. And so I'm, when I'm thinking about creating a, a timeless kind of design, I'm thinking about the future generations of kids yes. and adults and mm -hmm. thinking that, you know, a bad space for a badminton or horseshoes or it's important. And what am I not thinking about when you think about a timeless oh, that's generation a great. upon generation? So she's an acreage and she wants to make it timeless. So how, how does this, whatever she's putting in there now, how does that impact who lives there in the future? That is a great question, and I don't have a good answer for you because it depends on what your wishes are as a client now or the owner now. I would make it to what you want, unless you're going to sell it. I mean, if your goal is to buy the house, make it nice and flip it and sell it, and that's, that's a different story. But if, you, if you're planning on living there for a long time, I would make it so you're happy in it. And then the next person will decide if that makes them happy or if they want to change it up a little bit. So I was telling somebody else with an acreage that one of the things to think about, though, with an acreage is keep the intense gardens near the house and then have the outer ones be more, you can have those be more natural or, you know, that's where the grasses are or whatever that might be, the more open spaces. So that might be one thing to think about um, with, like, your badminton and all that kind of stuff. Maybe that happens a little farther away from the house and, the, and your more intense gardens are a little bit closer where you can really enjoy them and maintain them. And I'm not sure if I really answered you. I'm not giving you a good answer. Um, it's, hard to tell, it's hard to guess what someone in the future might want. That's, that's the hard part. But typically families would have kids, so you mm -hmm. have spaces yeah. for them and then not. I know. Yeah, you're right. You want large spaces if they're going to have kids and all that. But like you said, you just don't know how they're going to use it. I would definitely do it for yourself. Make yourself happy. And I'm sure whatever you do will be amazing for the next family. I'm sure it would. <laughs> Connie, you want to do the yeah, next one? One more. one more. Okay. A written question, and then certainly anybody that wants to, to ask a question from the crowd is fine, too. Um, how does scale play a part in creating a front yard patio, uh, i.e., should overall size of the house play a role? Oh, okay. So that's a good question. So we have some formulas in class. I think if I remember this correctly. Oh, I'm sorry. The question is, what, how do we determine the scale for a patio determinant on the size of a house? Is that correct? I hope that's correct. So usually you look at the size of the house, and I think it's, I want to say, I'm going to be totally wrong here. I think it's 2 thirds to the eve of the house. It should be the width of the patio. And I'm saying this to you. You don't have to memorize this. Basically, if you have a really tall house, you need to have the patio come out a little bit more. Or your bed lines. The bed lines, same thing. If you have a two-story house, your bed lines should, probably shouldn't be three feet wide. They should probably be 10 feet wide. So it's one of those things. That I can't give you a definite formula, but it's one of those things that you just want to make it a little, if it's a taller a house, you want your bed lines or your bed widths and your patio is just a little bit wider. Um, with that said, going back to the patio question, it isn't, sometimes it's not even about scale. Sometimes it's about how you're going to use it. So if you entertain a lot and you like to entertain and have 15 people eating out there at the same time, then you need to think about making sure it's big enough to accommodate a table that's large enough for 15 people. So sometimes it's just a matter of how you use the space also. But if you're not using it a lot and you just want to make sure it's in scale, I would say if it's a really tall house, you just want to go out farther. Um, and I'm, I thought it was two-thirds, but two-thirds seems really big if you have a two-story house. That seems like a big patio, but maybe not. I mean, you want to make sure it's big enough. You don't want this little patio right next to the house. I do have a, a sheet on my website that I got from, I think, con the Concrete Network, and it shows the sizes of patios you should have for how many people you're going to be sitting at a table. So you're welcome to, to find that on my website also and uh, for circle ch tables and square and, and those types of things also. Somebody else asked me a question. Also, can I just throw that in there really quick? Another good one. Someone asked me, um, they, they said they have a hilly backyard, and if they're using the lines of influence method and all these other things, how do they deal with that? Um, there's a couple ways you can do that. One is you work with the site. So I had mentioned you have lines of influence. You can pick shapes. Another thing that I didn't mention is working with the site that you have. Sometimes the site will tell you 
the shapes of your lawn. So if you have a steep site, you may have a long linear lawn because that's all you can have on that steep site. So sometimes you just have to work with the site or there might be a tree in the way or, or whatever that might be. So you, may, you have to make sure you work with what you've got. Um, if you do the lines of influence and there's lots of trees and different things happening, it's kind of fun because the trees will actually land in the grid and then you know which ones need to be beds and which ones need to be lawn. And I'll show you, I have a video of that, I'll show you that in here in a second. If you, hopefully you can see it in here, that might be too bright, but we'll, we'll, we'll try and see what happens. Are there any other questions? Yes? Yeah, you haven't mentioned much about pathways and I have sort of several questions about them. Yeah. One is at what stage of your whole sequence do you mm -hmm. design the pathways? Two, uh, do you think of them as a room or a boundary between rooms? And three, I'm interested in just traffic patterns because pathways aren't just about getting from A to B, they're about enjoying the garden. Yes, and yes. Did everybody hear all that? Right. We'll go one at a time. So the first one is at what point do you decide where the paths are yeah. in the process? So the bubble, the bubble diagram part where I was just in the blobs and I was just drawing some arrows, that's when you start determining where the paths should be. You're not, you, you don't know what the materials are at this point. You're just saying, I need a path from the front yard to the backyard or I need a path from the shed to the patio. And you start just drawing lines with arrows in there. So at that point is where you determine where they are. Um, at the preliminary design level is when you, after you've done the squares and the rectangles and all that, you need to decide where the paths fit in there. And then at the preliminary stages, you start to decide, okay, is this going to be limestone? Is it going to be gravel? Is it going to be mulch? Um, and then the last question was, oh, is it, do I consider paths rooms or just movement between rooms? Yeah, I mean, do you think of them when you're designing as a separate mm -hmm. room with the boundaries, or are they a boundary, or are they sometimes both? And yep. So, that is such a great question, and I got really loud all of a sudden. <laughs> aesthetically, I mean, they're not just yes. about getting to A to B, or they don't Correct. Go straight. Correct. So sometimes paths are rooms. Like that one picture I showed you where it was a really narrow space, and there was this little pathway in there. Some of you have side yards that all you can basically fit is the path and then some plant materials. That's what my side yard is that I love. My, one of my favorite areas is the path. Um, some of, sometimes the path is the room. And that's why I think you can do some really cool things with side yards and narrow spaces between buildings. Those are one of the, some of the more special rooms. And yes, the path is definitely the most integral part of that room. And then yes, when you go from space to space, the path should be special because you want that voyage or that adventure between rooms to be really special. So you want to think about that ground plane on the path and think about the materials that it is. Because I personally feel that adds to the neatness of a garden when the path is stone or brick or like we have brick paths in our yard and I just love that it just looks so cool that they're brick and not just concrete not against concrete concrete can be really cool too um, but yeah it could, they could be a room in themselves or and or yes they are a special component to getting from one space to the other so you really should think about what they look like and I have a friend that actually does a presentation on paths her whole talk is on paths and she does this fun exercise where she talks about the width of paths and how wide they should be for certain purposes, like utility could be narrower. Obviously, if you're walking side by side, you need wider paths, you know. Um, so those are the types of things to think about, too, and scale, all that. That is such a great question. You must do something very designy or something. No? <laughs> Just very thoughtful. Good. Well, someone else had a question back there. Oh, I, I think the microphone. Oh, okay. Go ahead. <laughs> I have a question about ornamental grasses, and I know we're talking about design. Uh -huh. but I'll they, try. <laughs> they can sort of be like we're trying to be naturalized, like mm -hmm. they can almost be a lawn, yes. but yet they can also belong in our cultivated areas. Mm -hmm. and, and my question is long term, will nature take over? You know what I mean? Do na ornamental grasses always have to be these very geometric little tight things in, in cultivated weed free? rocky beds. Do you know what I mean? Yes, I know what People you People that use them publicly. Yeah. And I'm just wondering if in your experience long term, what happens to clumps of grasses if in Iowa if we just let them go? Oh, I'm sure, I'm sure they, they would spread. Yeah, you can, it's really what your intent is as the designer. If you want them to be flowy, we were just talking about this. I have a presentation on planting models. And one of the planting models is matrix planting. And matrix planting is you have a dominant grass. They're not in rows, they're just in there, and then you have other plants kind of mixed in. And, it, and the idea is that you just kind of let it go. <laughs> I mean, I'm sure you're still maintaining it a little bit. I don't want to say nothing. Everything has maintenance, but, but
but yeah, definitely you can, and it would, yeah, you would eventually go. But yeah, you'll obviously as a garden, you still have to maintain it and make sure it stays within its bounds and exactly. But yeah, yeah, don't use rocks. If any of us got rock in their beds, take it out. No, <laughs> so, since she said that, I just thought I'd point that out. <laughs> any other questions? Oh, we got one back there and one over here. Oh, she's running. She's running over here. <laughs> And maybe you're going to cover this in a minute, but I was interested in how mature trees figure into the lines of influence. Yes. So how do the, the large trees and shrubs and other existing things work in the lines of influence? They're on the site, so when you put the grid on the site, however they land on it, you can either incorporate them into the grid by using them as part of the grid, or you can just see where the grid lands around them. And then when you lay out where the patio is on the grid and the bed lines, you just make sure that that tree falls into a bed line. And usually the existing things on the site will determine your design because you can't, obviously you're not going to remove a beautiful oak or, or whatever it might be. Uh, and that's one of the reasons I like lines of influence because when you put that grid on there, you just work around the things that are existing and you get this really unique design because of that, which is really fun. Do you want me to show that video? I don't know if it'll, I'm hoping it'll show up with the light. I don't know if we can turn on the lights or not, but... Let's see. Sometimes it's. So on this video, I'm showing a house and some existing trees, and I'm doing the lines of influence on there. So I'm creating a base map with all my structures, plants, and other ones. So you can see I have existing trees on here. And then I just start doing the grid on the site, and hopefully you can see it with the lighting. It's kind of light. So you see the white lines are really tiny, but so I'm starting to do those white lines. And then I have the grid on there. And then I talk about views, like what are my views? And I put those on there next, the green lines from windows and doors. So whatever you can do to make your grid, do that. Whether it's views, window edges, bed edges, whatever. And there's my circulation. I need to inc incorporate that too. So now I start using that grid and I work around all the plants and the buildings. And then I start laying out different ways you can do patios and bed lines. So there's my patio, the lawn, the green space. And then I'll do some other ones here too, so you can see what they look like. So here's some other ones. And then see how I'm working around the trees, making sure they're staying in beds. So that's how you do that. So you just kind of use that grid, then you just kind of work around the plants and make sure they stay in a bed. I don't like to have trees in the middle of the lawn, so I always try to make sure there's a bed that they're actually in a bed when I'm doing that. How about that for an answer for a question? We had videos for answers. Anybody else ever done that? No, no. <laughs> Do I get a bonus for that? I get a brownie, probably. Yeah, you get a brownie. <laughs> and we had a question actually back here, too. Did you have a question? <laughs> Sorry. Kind of going. <laughs> okay. <laughs> oh, yeah, the DC picture. Cool. <laughs> Not really, but that's what I'd like it to look like. Yeah. Um, <laughs> but I'm right next door. To, I mean, our houses are, you could maybe maybe a foot apart from the wow. house next door. What elegant uh, privacy walls are you seeing in your work that don't take up any space? <laughs> <laughs> like, you actually want privacy, like, tall? I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> I guess narrow. I guess narrow plants would probably be, I mean, or people can build like structures with vines and stuff. But obviously, you don't want to do it all the way around. But vines are a, kind of a tasteful way. Just be cautious. I know how hard that is when you like when you're all right there and you don't want this big fence to welcome people to your house either. But I would say narrow. Like do some research on narrow plants that are tall, and then yeah, vines and structures like that also. <laughs> Good luck. <laughs> <laughs> Any other questions? Did we cover it all? Yay. Thank you so much. You're welcome.